Hi, everyone. Thank you for watching our program. Don't forget, we're here every week. Feel free to subscribe to our channel and don't forget to share. Enjoy the program. Welcome to today's Love Talk Show with me, Helena. And with me, James. Today's topic, we're talking about how to cope with the death of a partner. Now, this is not something that you plan for or you think it's going to happen to you. Somehow, we human beings are very bad at thinking that someday a tragedy will happen. You know, we think we are exempt from tragedies. And this is not to say that you should plan something like this happen to you or that you should think about it. Absolutely not. But what we're talking about today is what do you do when it does happen? How do you cope with it? Mm -hmm. And possibly we are maybe the wrong people to tell you how to cope with it because we have never been through it. But we will have a guest here on the program today and someone who will offer um, an interview via Skype, the head of a charity, the chairwoman of a charity that has experience with this and has helped other people who are going through the same situation. Hopefully today's program will be very insightful. And if you are going through this or you know someone who's going through this, mm -hmm. do share this program with them as well. Indeed. But first, here's what's coming up in today's program. Coming up on today's show, if you've been sending questions in about love and relationships, stay tuned as we might just be answering them in this week's Dear Love Talk. On One Minute Bulletin, we'll be paying tribute to a couple who've been married for nearly 70 years. And we also have a quick roundup of this week's hot celeb news. Now, back to our topic, today we have the real life story of Linda Magistris, and she'll be sharing her difficult experience with today's subject, so do not miss this. We'll also be speaking to the chair of the widowed and young charity or way georgia elms will also be sharing her story but we'll be giving her advice too on this topic and what the charity does for those going through this ordeal plus we have our fantastic love talk regulars including this week's trip for two where Tapiwa and yasmin will finally be putting into practice what they've learned at the sosai cooking school in london so let's get started back to our lovely presenters james and helena for this week's dear love talk Welcome to Dear Love Talk, the segment of the program that answers any questions you may have on relationships. And here's how you can get in touch with us. All you need to do is to email us on questions at lovetalkshow.tv and that's it. Or contact us via Facebook as well. Yeah, Don't okay. forget Facebook. And Instagram and Twitter <laughs> and all those. Well, the first question <laughs> comes from Marsha and she says, because of financial circumstances, my husband and I have had to move in with a family friend. Since then, I have now found out that he has started an affair with her behind my back. I love my husband, but I don't know what to do about this. Well, before we, let's just make one thing clear. We cannot tell you what to do about this. This is your decision completely. Mm -hmm. But here's the one lesson, first of all, before we even carry on, that you need to take from this. When, when you're married, when you have a, a relationship with someone where you live in the same house and you, 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 you're forever connected with that person, it's a terrible, terrible idea to be sharing a house with someone else. I know that sometimes, you know, there's no other option, but then that period of time has to be as short and brief as possible. When you're single and you're living in a flat chair, and so it's not a problem, especially if you live in a big metropolis like London or whatever city you live in, it's not a problem, it's common. But when you get married, you, you need privacy. Plus, not having another person there, is a way of you protecting your marriage, protecting your relationship. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that goes out as a, a piece of advice to everyone out there. But in mm -hmm. terms of your own relationship and the situation with your husband, you have to tell him that this is not acceptable. And, and if he doesn't want to change and, 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 and you know, repent of what he's done and apologize mm -hmm. profusely, then 
you have to value yourself and say, look, hold on a second, mm -hmm. I, I deserve better. I don't deserve to be treated like this. So it's not only you need to tell him that if you do want to give him a chance, then you tell him that he needs to change and get out of that environment, go and live somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Or then if he doesn't want to change, then value yourself and move on with your life. I mean, we're not saying here that it will never ever happen that you have to move in with someone because of a financial problem or something that happened. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and we are not, not, not saying as well that your husband or your, or your wife will immediately start betraying you. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it happened to you. It's so unfortunate, but, you know, it's, but it's, it's definitely- it's an open door. It's an it open is an door open door. It is an open door and you shouldn't, you should uh, avoid uh, getting yourself into a situation like this. But indeed you need to, to uh, assess your relationship really well and see what's going on. Yeah. And if he doesn't want, the only solution for this would be if he were to speak to you and say, look, I regret this, I, I, I feel horrible about it, I, I should never have done this ever, but I, I, I want to change, please forgive me, let's move out and start afresh. If he doesn't want to do that, then you have some value personal, mm -hmm. own value, self-value, and move forward with your life. Indeed. Next question is for you. It's from a male viewer. Hello to every male out there. It's good to hear from you. Often we have women getting mm -hmm. in touch. Uh, and it says, my girlfriend broke up with me and my life is turned upside down. I can't sleep, I can't eat, don't want to see my family or friends. I just want to disappear from this earth. I constantly call her to, and try to see her at work, but she doesn't want to talk to me. Please help me win her back. Right, I'm gonna help you in a different way. Maybe not to win her back, but perhaps to, I want to, I don't know if there's an expression in English, but try to, Take a look at yourself. You know when you see in the cartoons, you come out of your own body and you look at yourself? Um, you can do that, but if you close your eyes, you can imagine yourself and all this behavior you're having. I mean, I understand it's heartbreaking that someone broke up with you and you had all these hopes and probably you like her, you, lo you love her. But if she broke up with you, then there has to be a reason why. And, and that should be enough for you to you know, give it some time and, and accept or give it some time and see what happens next. Because if you keep calling her, if you keep um, stalking her or something like that. It's a strong word, but I think that's the word. I, I think, think it is. Right I think it is. It's not, you're not helping yourself. You are making yourself really, really small. And that even makes her not want to be with you even more. Yeah, and the, bo the bottom line, if I can just say this, the bottom line, is that while you do all this, you're making yourself, you, you want to be the person she wants to talk to, to the most. But the truth is you're making yourself the least attractive man on earth. Right now, out of all the men on this planet, you are the last person she wants to speak to mm -hmm. because you, you've, you've invaded her space. You know, yeah. can I be honest with you? I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Have some self-respect. Going around, you know, begging her to speak to you, it, it has the opposite effect of uh, her coming back to you. So the question should not be, how do I win her back? The question is, you know, get some self-respect, man. You know, see that if it didn't work, it didn't work. And I, I know people say there's plenty of fish in the sea. We're not, we're not even going in that direction. We're just saying, have some self-respect so that you can build yourself up and be with someone, mm -hmm. whether it's her or someone else, but you're not gonna attract the right person doing that. So, exactly. you know, as Elena was saying very rightly, you know, have a good look at yourself and see that this is not the way to go about things. And maybe you are behaving this way because you're thinking, but we just broke up over something so silly. Well, here is the, here is the key thing. Maybe that person isn't right for you after all because one little thing make her give up. So do you, you don't want to convince the person to love you. Mm -hmm. You want the person to love you naturally. That's what will keep you together for many, many years to come and then forever. Yeah. So whether, whether she's the person for you or not, we don't know. What we can tell you is that this stalking, the word that Elena used and very rightly so, doesn't work. So focus on yourself, build yourself up yeah. and then you'll Move see on. what happens in terms of relationships. Move on.
That's all we have time for today in Deal of Talk Show. But remember, you can send us your questions via our Facebook page or also uh, on our email questions at lovetalkshow.tv. Mm -hmm. And maybe you've heard a question or two that maybe it doesn't apply to you. Maybe you, you didn't identify yourself with, this, with these topics. But maybe you know someone who is going through something similar. So remember, share our links, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you will never miss one deal of talk. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. This is why we always say to you, that if you do get married, if you start a relationship and you, you are living together, that it's very important to have your privacy. If mm -hmm. you have someone else there, there's not only the lack of privacy, but the danger of something that shouldn't happen, happening. Yes, and also, uh, of course, we're not even talking about family members living with you. Mm -hmm. So that would be another uh, you know, story altogether. But yeah, absolutely. Now, let's head over to our Love Talk correspondent, Jenny Cortez Ibanez, with today's news bulletin. Welcome to this week's One Minute Bulletin. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip's marriage has come under the spotlight after the new TV series, The Crown, has catapulted their relationship into the public eye like never before, giving the audiences an insight into the ups and downs of their early days as husband and wife. But no one can take away the fact that as they celebrate 69 years of marriage, this is indeed quite an achievement. With their relationship lasting a world war, scandal in the royal family, etc., couples all over the world could take a page from their book. And one of the lessons we can take away from them is this. When things get tough, stick closer together. And just before we go, we'd like to say a happy anniversary, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip from all of us here at Love Talk. But sadly, that's all we have time for. Join us again next time, only here on One Minute Bulletin. Congratulations are in order to Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Wow. Over 60 years. That is a lifetime. That's a long time to We would be love to interview them. Who knows? <laughs> Absolutely. I want to know their secret, what they've been doing, what they've done, because yeah. they've gone through many different generations. Buckingham Palace Watch Out will be knocking your door in, in a couple of days. So please <laughs> have a, a party waiting for us there. Anyway, let's crack on with the program. After the break, we'll get to speak to Linda Magistris, who has experienced the death of a partner. Yeah. And that led her to start uh, a charity of her own doing great work. You'll get to meet her mm -hmm. and we'll also have this week's Hot Celebrity News. We'll be right back. Hi everyone, thank you for watching our program. Don't forget we're here every week. And click here to subscribe so you can watch all our upcoming programs and never miss one. Hello you lovely lot and welcome to this week's Hot Celeb News. It seems that football superstar Cristiano Ronaldo is at it again in the love department. The father of one has been spotted recently all lovey-dovey with new love interest Georgina Rodriguez in Disneyland Paris. The couple tried to blend in with a crowd of tourists with the usually dressed to kill footballer wearing an oversized coat, a cap and sunglasses. Ronaldo's last serious girlfriend was Russian model Irina Shayk but has been linked to many glamorous women since then. It is understood that Irina ended their relationship after discovering he had been secretly texting girls all over the world. She immediately confronted Cristiano about it, but he initially denied any knowledge, a source told The Sun. After she explained to him what she had found, he eventually admitted to messaging the girls. He gave little excuse. She couldn't believe it, so immediately got out of the house. She ended the relationship there and then. So, will this new pair last? Well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And sadly, that's all we have time for. Keep up to date with all the latest happenings in the world of celebrities, only here on Hot Celeb News. Hello, welcome back. Today we're talking about how to cope with the death of a partner. It's not something you can prepare for, you don't mm -hmm. think about it, you only think about the good moments. 
And today we have someone here in the studio with us who has experienced this, and not only has she experienced this and gone through it, but she's also started a very important work to help others who are also going through this right now. I want to introduce to you our guest, Linda Magistris. Did I say that correctly? Yes, you did, thank you. Almost, almost correct. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, I think it's important for, for people to know before you talk about what you are doing right now to help mm. people who are in this situation. Um, for you to tell everyone at home a little bit about your experience, what, what happened to you when it comes to the topic we're talking about today? Yes, well, as you said, it's something you don't expect to happen. I actually lost my father 16 years ago, which mm. was traumatic and awful and devastating. But my partner that I lost two years ago was just a completely different thing. It was another league. Um, I was with him for eight years. We had an amazing mm. relationship, very, very close. Um, we had this incredible connection between the two of us. Um, but unfortunately, he got cancer mm. and it was terminal. We didn't quite realise when he got it. So... Again, you're sort of preparing yourself potentially for something, but you never actually can prepare yourself mm -hmm. totally when mm -hmm. someone actually goes. So I think you have to deal with the shock, uh, first of all, yeah. even though he had cancer and we were sort of slightly prepared. Um, but then he's gone forever. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, sent me into a completely different world. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that he was sort of in a pot it's, I still can't get my head around it. You know, the fact that somebody who's been cremated was one minute was sitting next to you, exactly. talking to you, laughing like we are, you know, mm -hmm. thinking. And the next minute, they're actually not anywhere. I think sends your mind into somewhere that you can't actually cope with. So there's so many different emotions. Is it, yeah, is it something like, do you feel that, you know, that hasn't actually happened? It's not real. Do you, it, it's like, do you have trouble, you know, really thinking this has happened, I need to deal with it? Definitely at the time, and you hear that a lot. The people that I'm working with now, the bereaved, they are exactly the same space as I was back then. Basically, you feel very disconnected, totally isolated. You don't understand what has happened to you, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. You can't feel connected with what's happened because it's so far away from where like you were. It's surreal, right? Very completely surreal. surreal. Mm -hmm. So you sort of, I was sort of observing life for, for quite a long time. You know, and even now I tend to observe life a lot more than I did before he died. So it's awful because it's very isolating experience because you don't really know who to turn to, who can, who you can connect with, because you don't think anyone understands what you're feeling until, yes. thankfully, I did find other people who've been through the same experience, and that was a lifeline yeah. to me. And, and oh. this, this is one of the points I wanted to pick up on, because, you know, perhaps when you lose someone you truly love, your family, usually family members come together, try to support you, mm. and yet you probably have never had another situation in life where you feel so isolated. So it's like a... a, a it's difficult to understand because you're surrounded by people uh -huh. who love you, but yet you feel isolated. Yeah. yeah. It's, exactly. very, it's very difficult. It is very difficult. And also, often those people who love you have maybe never experienced the loss that you mm -hmm. have. So they can't really understand. Mm -hmm. they, know, they don't get it, mm -hmm. as we talk about. You know, oh, people so. who have been bereaved sort of talk about people who get it and people who don't get it. Mm -hmm. And they can be as empathetic as you like. It's really lovely and they're very kind. And the funeral, obviously, is a lot going on. And then afterwards, a few months down the line, people sort of ask if you're OK. And then it does peter off. People mm -hmm. sort of get back into their own lives. And then you, again, feel even worse mm -hmm. because you had that sort of love and, and comfort around you. And people were asking how you were and what you wanted and, and helping you. But then they sort of tend to sort of drift off a bit, especially around the year mark, because a lot of people think by the time a year's over, maybe you should be moving on. Yeah. You know, I was told yeah. maybe you should move on now. Yeah. You know, like maybe you should think. It's not that on. long anyway. I mean, how can you prepare? Sometimes, mm. of course, it's, it's a cousin, it's an uncle, it's a grandparent. Mm. But, you know, someone you are with every single day, share those small list of things together. Yeah. It's a different... It is totally I don't know if there's such a thing mm. as a different level of loss, but uh, to me, listening to your story, mm. it seems to be really... Uh, wow, it must have been really painful. Where I mean, I, I know that you had, when that happened, and you were looking for help, mm. for someone who would understand what you were going through and try to give you advice. Mm. I mean, did you, did you feel that there was enough help out there or you felt it was difficult no, to find No, unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't feel as though people really understood how 
catastrophic mm -hmm. it is. Again, that's a word that a lot of people use. It's catastrophic, it's life-changing, it's debilitating. You can't actually get off the sofa most days. Mm -hmm. You can't physically stand up. I mean, a lot of people go into debt. I mean, I have problems with trying to deal with bills because you think, what is the point? Mm -hmm. What is the point of doing something so mundane when someone who was there is not there anymore and you're trying to sort of you know get through those feelings it's like so, nothing else really matters no completely everything is very very um it's completely not important. Used, yeah nothing else really compares to the feelings that you have and if nobody else understands you're at a loss you're at sea and again we talk about sort of the storms mm -hmm. that you know you're sort of riding that storm um and sometimes thankfully down the line it does get a little calmer but then it just comes back again it's like a roller coaster. The emotions just keep coming back with different triggers. And it's an ongoing process. Grief really doesn't finish, unfortunately. Right. So where, where, how, where, how and where did you find help? I mean, mm -hmm. how long did it take you, but where did you find the help you felt? That really help uh, you know helped you to move forward at a point at and a then, yeah uh, ended up inspiring you um, to help other people exactly there, like, through the well same. my help came through a charity called widowed and young which was just a lifeline to me because they were pretty much my age group they understood because they'd lost a partner and to mm -hmm. me it's very unique when you do lose a, lose a partner mm -hmm. so that to me was that was fantastic we'd started events I started being the London coordinator for them so we put together um, coffee mornings dinners getting together and that you could then talk and a lot of the time we didn't talk about our partners we talked about everything else but there was this understanding there was this bond there was a warmth and a friendship mm -hmm. that you knew you were safe then mm -hmm, and right. it was just a real turning point for me and I thought right okay and then having spoken to all these different people I got different stories about how terrible their you know bereavement support mm -hmm. was and how how they really struggled and then through these past two years that's what I've been doing is researching it and finding yes there is a massive lack of bereavement support unfortunately in our country yes. which we're trying to now repair through the Good Grief Trust which is the charity that I've recently such set up. a great idea I was reading your story and I was thinking this is such a great idea mm -hmm. because I know people who lost someone and I mean, as a friend, or I don't know, I would even would like you to give some advice to family members and friends out there how to help someone in that situation because you don't really know what to say. You don't want to mm -hmm. make it worse. You don't want to. So it is exactly. Such a, a lot a of people don't idea. say anything, and actually, that, that brings me to this point. Let me just read this out. This is something on our Facebook that's reached nearly two hundred thousand people. This is a post that was um, re-shared. Uh, 1600 times right. wow. this says if you know someone who has lost a very important person in their life and you're afraid to mention them because you think you make make them sad by reminding them that they died you're not reminding them they didn't forget that they died what you're reminding them of is that you remembered that they lived and that's a great great gift and that's what friends and family unfortunately find very difficult to do is to speak about the person who has been lost and that is the worst thing you can do is to ignore that so talk about it as normal then utterly because talk about the, I, it as I think that's the difficult point I mean I, I've never had to thankfully be in that situation I, I probably wouldn't know what to say to someone who was mm -hmm. in a situation I think your, your for dad most passed people, away when you were young but it's, it's but slightly it's, it's different, different but yeah and I think for most people we, we probably think I don't want to mention this because I don't want to make the person feel worse or I'm, mm -hmm. I want to help the person to forget that this has happened and you're saying that the best thing is to be open and talk about it. Absolutely. The worst thing you can do is not talk about them right. because then they die again, as the piece says. Mm. You don't want them to die again. You want them to live. A lot of families with young children have the photographs of their mums and dads around. They talk about them as though they're in the house together and they say, oh, what do you think dad would do tonight? Oh, what do you think mum would do tonight? Because you need to keep their memory alive. They are still there. They are still with you. They haven't really died. They're still right. part of you. They're never going to be not part of you so to just have the, a shrine or have a photo that maybe occasionally you mention is just really right. I found for, with my experience is not the right thing to do sure. okay. I think we're running out of time but there's two more things I wanted to ask you first I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with your your own charity yes. that you've now set up and tell us a little bit about that okay the good grief trust is the charity that we put together it's going to be an umbrella charity that's going to bring all those other fantastic organizations and support groups under the one umbrella mm. because at the moment there are amazing support groups up and down the country, locally, nationally, but it's
it's very difficult to find it. You don't have that energy. You don't have the resources. Right. Lots of the professionals don't have them either. So we're going to put together this fantastic website called thegoodgriefguide.com, and that is going to house everybody. So one, one click of a button, everyone's going it's to like find it. It's like a one-stop shop for mm. Absolutely. But the key is to find everybody before that. So the moment they walk out that hospice, that hospital, if the police turn up at the door, they need to have that information mm -hmm. with them because a lot of people are not getting the comprehensive right. information. So that's our key, the website, but also have something that someone yeah. can ta mm -hmm. be tangible for them. And, and I think the final question, the most important question is, if someone is watching us right now and they are going through bereavement, they've lost mm -hmm. their partner, mm -hmm. what would be the one most important piece of advice you can give to them right now? Find someone who understands. Find a peer support group. I really think that is the key. If you've lost a child, if you've lost a parent, if you've lost a sibling, a friend, find someone. There are lots of support groups around that have people that you can have a coffee with, you can go and chat with. That to me, in my experience and the research that I've done over the past two years, is the key to find someone who gets it. Find someone who understands, who's been in your shoes right. and who know, has had a similar experience. So, so basically, even though you feel like being alone, don't be alone. Yeah, socialize no. a little alone. bit. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you're going to have to need time to, yes, to, to adjust and everything. Mm -hmm. But if you can have have that sort of courage to go out, really, honestly, everybody tells me it's the key to moving on and just feeling supported, definitely. Right. Oh, Linda, thank, thank you so, so much, much for coming pleasure. on the program. Thank you. And for sharing your story. Thank, thank you so you. much. I'm sure thank your story you. helped a lot of people today. I hope so. It did. And we, we are going to go for a break. But when we come back, we are going to be speaking to the chair of the Widowed and Young Charity, Georgia Elms. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Today we're talking about how to cope with the death of your partner. We mm -hmm. earlier spoke to Linda Magistris, mm -hmm. who has gone through this and also her experience helped her to start this charity that is doing a lot of work in helping mm -hmm. people in the same situation. Indeed, and helping other people, which is something she noticed uh, wasn't around that much. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really, really good. That's right. Now, let's go and see how people in the streets of London think that the best way to cope with the death of a partner is and how perhaps they would react in this situation. Mm -hmm. Have you ever lost a partner or know anybody who has? No, he's good. Yes, I have. A relative of mine. Not that I can think of right now, but obviously, yeah. Of course, I think something more recent that I can talk about is I just, my best friend last week, he lost, his sister lost her husband and she just gave birth to a new baby, so it's a really troubling time for him right now, actually. But in your, in your opinion, what is the best way to cope with the loss of your life partner if you ever had to go and deal with something like that? Honestly, I don't have a clue because it's so tough and I think uh, people are totally adorable when they uh, manage to go through this and uh, honestly, I, I don't have any solutions, like any unique solutions for everybody how to cope with it. What is the best way, in your opinion, to cope with the loss of your life partner? Having seen your relative go through it? Mm, the, I don't know if it's a, there's a best way. It's... Uh, uh, he, um, he took a, it took a lot of him to... Uh, a lot of time for him to get past his uh, loved one. Well, now he, he sees other women because it's been more than 10 years now. What I've been doing this past week is uh, I've took him out for dinner and I've been staying around him, inviting him and making sure that he's not staying within like his room all day, very depressed because he's be, like feeling very down lately. I think like thinking of them as not gone and they're still watching you uh, like from above, from the sky and like thinking that they love you and they would not want you to be sad and like keeping their love your strength and stuff like that. Um, any advice that you could give to uh, those that might have lost somebody recently? I think it's very hard to be very proactive about it because you're in a state of like just darkness sometimes and like you feel very alone but something that you should really do first is be surrounded by people that you love so they can uplift you and help you move forward with your life because that's going to be a struggle on your own. And then also you should really yourself find the things that you like and enjoy and do them actively so you don't get stuck in a very depressive mode as you're like moving through. 
probably I will try to change the focus to work harder or to help somebody else, just not to think about it. It's my way to avoid the problem. Uh, but still, I don't think it's like, I'm not sure it's the only way to cover the problem. Well, you can, I guess you can only know what to do if you are really in that situation. Um, or, because everyone reacts in different ways, mm -hmm. isn't it? People... Uh, it's, it's very difficult and people grief differently. Exactly. Right? People cope with things that. differently. So I think it's very, unless you've actually gone through that, it's mm -hmm. very difficult to offer advice to someone who is going through mm -hmm. that. I think that's the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's why we, we found it was very important to talk to someone who's gone through this and who's helping other people to overcome mm -hmm this particular situation. We had a, an opportunity to talk to, with Georgia Elms, who's the chair of Widowed and Young Way, um, a charity that um, Linda already mentioned. Let's see what she had to say about her own experience and how Way has helped people who are in this situation. We've been privileged enough to be able to have a chat with Georgia Elms, the chair of Widowed and Young Charity, or way. Uh, Georgia, welcome to the program. Hello, Hello. thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. Now, um, before we, we speak about way, um, I think it's important perhaps if you were to give people at home um, maybe a background about your, your own story, if that's okay, and how you came across way. Okay. Um, my husband, uh, Jonathan Elms, died um, suddenly on July 26, uh, 2006. Um, he died from meningitis. So before that, I didn't know, didn't think, know anything about being widowed young. I uh, didn't think it would ever happen to me. Right. Um, and but no, as I say, I um, we had a, a one-year-old daughter called Daisy, and it was two weeks after her first birthday. Um, he was he was fine, and then he wasn't. And at five thirty five thirty eight. Uh, no, 9.38 on the Wednesday morning, um, they were switching his, I was signing a form to switch off his life support machine. Um, and then I found out I was pregnant the following day. Um, wow. So it was all a bit of a shock. It was something that I didn't, you know, as I say, I'd, I'd never, <laughs> I didn't know anyone who'd been widowed at my age. Um, I, yeah, I, I got one daughter, I was pregnant with an, uh, another, and it was a nightmare. Um, and then a friend of mine who was in my baby group brought around um, a magazine um, probably about two days after my husband had died. Um, and in there was an article um, with somebody called Cheryl Johnston, who'd been, right. uh, who used to be the general secretary of Way. Um, and in that she talked about Way, um, which I'd never heard of. Um, I I went went to their website, um, looked at it, uh, and then decided I didn't want anything to do with it because if I joined, then I would be definitely widowed. Um, and say so your mind is not right when when it's just happened. Right. Um, but four months later, I, I joined. Tell, can you tell us a little bit about what Way is and and how it supports people who you know who come to find help in mm -hmm. its services? Okay, we're a peer to peer support network, so. As a charity, we we cannot provide um, we, we don't provide counselling as such. But basically, we um, put people we give people the opportunity to get in touch with people. Um, mm -hmm. When I was widowed, obviously, as I said earlier, you know it was a big shock. I'd never met anybody widowed. Um, when you join Way, you suddenly realise that there's people all over the country. Um, and I actually even found out about somebody who was pregnant and her son was due on the same day as, as my baby. So um, I was able to talk to her and her husband had died suddenly. So I was able to talk to her um, about it. So you cannot, you, you just can't quantify the, what it's like to actually talk to somebody who just gets it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Suddenly thrown into this position where you, you just don't know what happened. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I had panic attacks. Um, I just didn't know anything. And I spoke to other people who said, you know, that's normal. Um, mm -hmm. And 
so yeah, there's, there's lots of services that Wade does that we that we've got. Um, so if you prefer to be, be talk to people via Facebook, you can. We've got a a website which has got a forum, um, and then you can message people. You can find out if you've got people nearby. We've had some people that have found out there's people on their road that they've never spoken to before. Right. They were widowed as well. Uh, I think That's so interesting. something I wanted to find out from you, I mean, is, is it when you are receiving help, when you're talking to someone, is it mentally different to know you're talking to someone who's been through the same thing that you've gone through, uh, rather than talking to, for example, a friend or family member who loves you and supports you but hasn't experienced that? Is it different? Um, I think the thing is, is that everybody... Um Go to, everyone experienced uh, grief differently. Mm. Um, with me, uh, I just wanted to know that what I was feeling was normal, um, and, and I still do. Ten years on, mm-hmm. um, obviously it's different now. But it, so it's sort of reassurance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I could talk to family members, and often they just, you know, they, they love you to bits and want to make it better, and they can't. Right. Um, so they'll probably say, you know, <laughs> often. Uh, people who haven't been through it will say the wrong thing, you know, and they'll say, oh, you'll get better or Mm -hmm. time heals. And that's actually not what you want to hear at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, But but other people, you know, they do just understand, they totally understand what you're going through. And you just say, you just can't quantify it. It's, uh, you need, need, uh, well, I definitely Mm -hmm. needed that. You you Uh, need that to know that it's okay. uh, George, just one question uh, quickly. What worked for you in order for you to overcome the difficult times you went through when you lost your husband, John? What actually helped you? I know that you, you, you got to meet other people, talk to other people, but was it something you heard, something that, or was it just a talking? What, what was it? Because we, we do have people watching us now and, and maybe they're like wanting to ask you questions, but they can't, obviously, they are at home watching you. What, what would you say was, you know, what helped you overcome that difficult moment. I think one of the big things that people said is that's normal. I think, as, as I said earlier, uh, everybody experiences grief differently. Um, and I did wonder whether or not I was supposed to be doing something or not, or, you know, I mean, I suffered panic attacks. Um, but just to know that other people had. So I, I think the fact that some people kept saying to me, you know, this is normal. Um, this is okay and you will be okay you will never get over it but you will be okay Um, that that, that was the big thing for me so that was comforting okay yeah okay Um, and and any I mean how can people get in touch um, with where you mentioned the website is anything else that they can do I mean uh, any what's more effective is it Facebook or or any any way works we have so we have um, our website, www.widowedandyoung.org.uk. Um, you go to there, there is a lot of information on there, not just for people who are widowed, but people who are related to people who are widowed who okay. know. It tells you how to um, get on, you know, how, how to talk to people, how you can actually help people. Um, and then there is a join. So there's a join button. Um, the only way to access Way at, at the start is is by joining. Right. Um, there is a membership fee of twenty-five pounds, which just covers our um, administrative costs, mm-hmm. um, and we have one one member of staff at the moment. Um, but yeah, we do have a, a Facebook page, but you can't access our Facebook page, our closed Facebook page, mm-hmm. unless you are an actual member. Right. We do have a, a public Facebook page, but that doesn't actually you can't actually join sure. by that. That is oh. more for people to find out information. But the mm-hmm. website is the main place to go. Right. right. I think that's going to help people who probably need to talk to someone yeah. there and then, and especially if it's 24 hours a day. I think that's mm-hmm. going to be. Is that is that your your cat there? <laughs> yes. That's okay. He's going to be part of our show. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be part of our show. That's great. We have a cat as well. He's he's very small. Only it's what, a she. A she. Hello. She's, she's five months. But that's we'll, we'll probably do another program on on cats some other day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry oh, about that. My cat no ignores problem. me, and when she sees me on the phone, that's it. She comes straight. That's Tiger Lily. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Georgia, thank you so much for joining us. Indeed. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank Thank you. Bye bye. It's it's interesting that listening to Linda and also Georgia, 
we can see that there's they say something in common like mm -hmm. they've done something uh, the same thing which is uh, talking to other people who've been through the same situation actually helps. I know that the tendency is for people to isolate themselves and think that no one understands. Yeah. Which, in a way, I mean, no one is in your shoes or in that person's shoes. In a way, it's true. But talking to other people yeah. who are going through the same thing really helps. And, and yes, and I think that's the key, talking to someone who's going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's important to talk to your family and friends, but sometimes you... you, you perhaps think, you know, how can this person help me if they don't know what I'm going through? So if you are going through this right now, get in touch with way I'm sure that perhaps they can um, mm -hmm. help you, at least support you. Indeed. Now we're going to go to a brief break. When we come back, we'll see how Yasmin and Tapiwa did this week in their trip for two. And we'll also have our final messages on today's topic. We'll be right back. We hope you're enjoying the program. And remember, you can get in touch with us, sending us an email to questions at lovetalkshow.tv and we will answer your questions here on this program. Or if you want to have a one-to-one -one with us and you're going through a difficult moment in your life and you need some specific advice, write to us again on the same email address and we'll be happy to arrange an appointment with you. Get in touch. Welcome back. So if you've been following our program today, you know we're talking about how to cope with the death of your partner, mm -hmm. someone you love, someone you've been committed to. And here's the thing. We can only begin to imagine how difficult and soul-wrenching it is to lose someone you love and vow to spend the rest of your life with. It's, it's painful beyond belief. Mm -hmm. It's true, you know, when you commit to a relationship and you are both happy, you never plan for that person to suddenly no longer be with you. And even though you know it is a possibility, somehow you never think it will happen to you. That's right. And I think we human beings are experts in thinking that bad things and tragedies only happen to other people. But whether we, whether we like it or not, there's always a possibility that bad news may knock your door. Mm -hmm. And you can never be truly prepared to lose the person you thought would be next to you until the end. It's true. Perhaps the, the one most important thing for everyone, you know, who may be going through this right now is actually to make sure you find someone to go through this together with you. If there is one thing we've learned from the guests here tonight is that finding someone who understands you is an important part of making it through the grieving process. Yeah, because you, you're going to have to go through this. It's painful, it's but it's one way or the other, you have to. And I can understand how many people feel like they just want to hide away from the world and be by themselves, but this can make things more difficult. Whoever you feel that is close to you and you trust, try to share what you're going through with this person. We know, as we, we've heard from Linda earlier, that that grieving process, there is the part where you may want to be alone for a while, but if possible, try not to make that be extended for too long. Mm -hmm. Some people think that this won't do much good, but while it's true that this person cannot take away your pain, you should remember a problem shared is a problem halved. That's right. So if there's one thing we would like to, you to take from this program mm -hmm. is that you don't have, nor should you want to go through this by yourself. You will be amazed at how talking to someone you love can help you to eventually move forward. Indeed. Maybe your neighbor went through that. Maybe someone mm -hmm. really close nearby and you don't know. And through these charities, you get to know people who are yeah. nearby who actually went through or are going through that same thing. That's right. Now let's see what Tapiwa and Yasmin got up to in this week's trip for two at the Sozai Cooking School. Okay guys, so now the most exciting part of the of the day because um, we're actually going to make the sushi, of course with the guidance of our instructor Izzy. So Izzy, please tell us where do we start? 
Okay, you need to uh, wet your hands gently. The wet hands are for yep. the rice, isn't Hold, it? Yeah. Grab a hand, a handful of sushi rice. And then just spread, spread it. Spread it. Yeah. You're making a good looking, nice, tasty sushi. Yes. We My, try. Mine's already looking <laughs> ready to eat. Let's make a decoration. Yes. yes. Ready for the next step. Yeah. Can I put pink You could, on? yeah, you could actually. Uh, that pink, it shows a man's masculinity or something like that, so <laughs> but to exercise my <laughs> masculine side. Oh yeah. When you're ready, you can turn it. Turn it over. Over. Okay. You could actually lift it and flip it. Lift it and flip it. Yeah. So like this. No? Yep. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Oh. It's done. You've done there it too. There we go. <laughs> now you need to turn, turn it around. This yeah. If you like wasabi, just put wasabi in the center of the nori. I'm just going to put a tiny... I think uh, less than that. Less, yeah, than, less that. than that. Some underneath. The bubble bite. Underneath. Yeah, all of the fingers in the cool ingredients. You lift it up. The bamboo mat edge like landing this. safely on the nori. That's it. Rolling. Yeah. Open a little bit bamboo mat and then push. Roll it over. It's a really thick. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Ooh, it looks nice. Excellent. Wow. Shall we cut? Yes. Can you use this mic? Yeah, we do. Yeah, just cutting like a lot of little movement. Okay. Like a cut in a cake. Oh okay. yeah. It's quite soft, aren't they? And the your blade again. What do you do? Yeah. It's I just want to eat it right now. <laughs> Hers looks neater than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I think I lost one, one sushi. You lost one. <laughs> oh, there. Looks good. <laughs> you saved it. It's not as easy as it looks. Just letting the viewers know. <laughs> so this is your first sushi made. Yes. Is it easier than you thought? No. no. It's harder <laughs> than I thought. It's harder than I thought. Oh. I'll put it on there anyways. Well done. Very good. Okay, so that was great. That was really cool. I mean, we've actually made our first ever sushi mm -hmm. and I didn't know I was going to be able to do it, but we really did it. And thank you so much, Izzy. Our you, pleasure. You, you made it so much more easy for us to understand, you know, a bit of history on sushi. And so it was really a fun activity for us. And thank you so much, um, Sozai Cooking School. We really enjoyed it today and we're really looking forward to next week. Izzy, could you tell us next week what we're going to be learning next to make? Next week, um, you're going you're gonna to learn futomaki. Futomaki is big chunk roll. Wow. Giant okay. chunky roll. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. So, guys, we're really excited for next week. Make sure you're tuned in. And we'll see you again here on Trip, Trip for, for two. two. And to watch the full version of this class, you can head over to our YouTube channel, Love Talk Show, underneath the playlist Trip for Two. Happy watching. Yay. Yeah. Well, it's awesome to see Tapio and Yasmin putting into practice what they learned from the cooking instructor Easy. And for Yasmin, it was her first time making some sushi. It looked delicious and I'm sure it tasted delicious. I wish I was there too. We're big fans of sushi. <laughs> we are. Next week, we'll take a break from all the sushi making and we'll see what Yasmin and Tapio will be up to in our next show. Mm -hmm. Now, we hope that you've enjoyed this week's program. It was a very different topic but we hope that it's been helpful and if you do know someone who's going through this situation you may not be going through this situation but if you do know someone who is then do share the link of this program with that person I'm sure it will help them a great deal indeed and if you have any other questions or anything else you want to say a topic you want to suggest do get in touch with us email us on questions at lovetalkshow.tv also remember that we hold weekly seminars where you can come and and sit down and listen for yeah. an hour and about and, and talking about our seminars they have now changed from saturdays to thursdays at 8 p.m. Good point. <laughs> Remember also you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is why it's... <clears throat> Sorry. And for Yasmin, it was her first time making some sushi. Oh, no, and it, it's moving too fast. Do you mind going slower? <laughs>
Hello. Now we do again. <laughs> Let me do that again. So guys, that's what we're going to be learning next week. <laughs> And we're really excited. Thank you so much, um, Sozai um, Cooking Classes. And we really, I said it wrong today, cooking school. Just for one second, we've got a bit of food on there. I didn't eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just the, no, it's just a little, you oh. might think you've already eaten this sushi. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I didn't. <laughs> and to watch the full version of this class, um, sorry. And to watch the full class, sorry. And that's all for today's Love Talk show. Be sure to tune in next week to learn more on how to love intelligently.